So this time I received uh, the very special topic. How do environmentalists imagine the next 50 years for Hong Kong? And I was brainstorming what kind of imagery I would like to present to the audience. And should I? Okay. And so, yeah, so some of my friends were saying that you must tell people we are in a climate emergency and we can imagine scenic sceneries of sea level rise and Hong Kong being flooded. And this was a very powerful imagery, uh, personally speaking, uh, seeing how the half, some of the clock tower in Team Secretary was flooded and, and even the pier and might be totally dysfunctioning. Mm -hmm. This is an image from Climate Central predicting if we're going business as usual path, we might be facing a scenery like this mm -hmm. of sea level rise. And then there are lots of uprising movement from grassroots. Uh, this is a climate march image from 2019. A lot of youths in Hong Kong came out to say that we should be responsible for our planet and stopping fossil fuel investment, et cetera. We have a very prominent climate march led by Greta Thunberg, Fridays for Future. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this funny GIF, and it was also my initial uh, thinking for the next 50 years. <laughs> uh, this is a guy handing off the planet to the next generation, be like kicking a ball off planet Earth to a kid <laughs> and then hitting the kid that the kid fell to the ground. But as much as we think, yeah, as much as we think that the future is very grim and doom and gloom imageries, I recently read a book by Rutger Breckman, uh, mm -hmm. Humankind for History. And one of the quote really inspired me saying that our grim view of humanity is a noticeable. If we want to solve the greatest challenges of our times from the climate crisis to our growing distrust of one another, then I think the place we need to start is our view of human nature. And therefore I think we are perpetuating this hopeless image, this image of destruction, of devastation, but we don't have enough hope to empower people to make changes that we want. We are facing a lot of grand challenges at local and global levels. We can see this image of the Amazon on fire, a lot of deforestation happening, and then social unrest in Hong Kong, in other places, political instability, hunger, flooding. But what if the noticeable effect is in place, which means we don't uh, something is not as bad, but because we have the image that uh, this medicine has a side effect, then we feel the side effect, even if the side effect does not exist. Mm -hmm. So I'm proposing that maybe we can take a more hopeful view of the future. Mm -hmm. And this is where I want to share a quote, uh, my personal experience at the COI conference, Conference of Youth in 2019 in Madrid, where the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres shared with us, a message must not be a message of despair, but a message of hope. Things can be done, resources exist. What is still missing is a political will. And this is where youth initiative is extremely important. As a member of the society, as a youth, 23 year old, I think what we should be doing is to continue spreading the hopeful message. And this is a very symbolic hmm. image by a TED talk speaker, Simon Sinek saying uh, what, how do we motivate ourselves and how do we pitch people to buy in with our idea by starting with why. Mm -hmm. And now I'd like to share with you a short excerpt of my climate journey. My why was climate change. Back in primary school, I was involved in a school project where I met a poet for Dr. Rebecca Lee. And she told me that, imagine the planet is trapped in an oven of continually rising temperature. The earth is on the verge of explosion. This is how she described global warming to me and I was so impressed. By that time, it was, it was just, uh, nobody was talking about climate change at all. Mm. It was a very early stage. But since then, because of this imagery implanted in my mind, I began to follow the climate news and get to know more about climate change. And one thing that I would recommend a lot of people uh, attending the conference, youths or even children, what we can do. One powerful way to equip ourselves is through education. 
I'm sure Winnie would <laughs> agree because she's a great lecturer. And I started my academic pursuit at University of Oxford in 2019, where I'm pursuing an MPhil in environmental change and management. And now I'm doing my research on energy decarbonization of Hong Kong and Beijing, hoping to see how Chinese cities can realize the net zero targets through energy policies. I've been meeting a lot of uh, interesting people, advocates from around the world, from Brazil, from Singapore, uh, from Peru. Each and every one of us has a very strong passion for particular issues, uh, such as someone is very concerned about farming, the future of food, uh, someone's very concerned about indigenous rights in Peru in the Amazon rainforest. And I also met one of my most inspiring idols, uh, Dr. Kate Worf, who proposed the concept of donut economics. She gave a very inspiring TED talk saying that we should have an economy that is designed to thrive, not grow. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, we think GDP economic growth is the buzzword. We need to chase for GDP increase every year, year after year. But then she proposed this donor economics model where we should keep our economic development within the ecological boundary, the planetary boundaries of our planet, such, such thresholds such as ocean acidification, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen loading, which are already exceeded. But at the same time, we need to remember how to meet our social needs, including social equity, food, shelter, health, and etc. And aside from academic work, I continue communicating the importance of the SDGs proposed by the United Nations and the climate crisis. In, in 2019, I advocated to host a youth forum for the long-term decarbonization strategy for the public engagement exercise in Hong Kong, which Winnie is also involved in, where I met her and saw the amazing work that her team did. And I was serving on a global volunteering network, SDSN Youth, and also engaged at COP25. So now I'd like to share some insights from the COP conference. Unfortunately, this year it's been delayed due to the pandemic, but from last year, I've got a lot of insights, which I hope to share, continue sharing with youths in Hong Kong and to see how we can work better for a sustainable future. And one point uh, uh, continually reinforced by members there, including uh, the executive Sec secretary of UNFCCC, Patricia Espinosa. She told us that climate change should be embedded into the city planning and budgeting of policies at all levels of the government. It's not just at the national level, but also a city level like Hong mm -hmm. Kong and even in different 18 districts. How do we embed the concept of resilience and climate change so that we're building a city that's future proof, that is not subjected to things like automobility? Why do we need to rely on road expansion or private cars to continue expanding our city? What about building a more walkable and cy a cyclable city? And then another point I want to make is the importance of empowering grassroots movements. I've met a lot of representatives from small island states, especially youths there. They're very concerned about their future because this 1.5 degree threshold is their life and death issue. People from uh, Fiji, uh, from Solomon Islands, they're facing the imminent threat of their homeland being flooded. And there are also least developed countries uh, such as Bangladesh fa facing these uh, unfair uh, climate consequences, uh, their flooding, droughts, and et cetera. And how do we as youth push for mobilizing grassroots movements? And in that picture, I was giving, uh, presenting at the open dialogue with the COP25 president from Chile, telling that youth wishes to incorporate more citizen science and mainstream them into traditional IPCC reports, not just using very expert high level scientific knowledge, but also seeing how we can connect these traditional wisdom, indigenous knowledge into the decision-making processes. And last but not least, there was, um, this is a core cool part of my climate journey where I just joined a random competition when I was in freshman year at Chinese University of Hong Kong mm -hmm. and it eventually turned into a social enterprise, which I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very happy for right now. This is related to the issue of aviation and climate change. These are just uh, some figures showing us what is the impact of aviation on our carbon emission per capita? We can see that the world average emission is around 4.9 tons and one round trip from Hong Kong to New York is already 5.2. So adding on to that, it actually doubles our average footprint. And therefore I think local tourism is a good way for us to combat climate change. 
This is why we hope to adopt a bottom-up approach to promote local tourism through online media, as well as holding eco tours to raise public carbon literacy, especially on emission from aviation. And this is the reason why I founded this group called Fair Hong Kong. Uh, Fair is a homophone to the word Fair, which means green in French. And, Hong, and we are a youth-initiated group hoping to promote climate action and environmental education through sustainable local tourism. These are some of our mission and key action areas, hoping to lower carbon emission per capita and raise environmental awareness and carbon literacy through local tourism, public education, and youth empowerment. And I want to share with you this impact model. Mm -hmm. We believe that change starts from experience. Getting people to nature, building their connection and love for nature through providing them a holistic, comprehensive ecotour experience around valuable natural assets in Hong Kong. And eventually we can educate them, enlighten them, and finally empowering them. What does empowerment mean? It means building, planting the seeds in the hearts of many so that they can spread the message to more people around them. And these are some of the partners that we have engaged with. We're hoping to bridge the civil society, the public and the private sector, as well as academic institution hoping to do more research on different policies and to see how we can further promote this uh, attitude of low carbon lifestyle and sustainability. Uh, this is our web page if you want to take a look at it. We've also published a book in 2017 and holding different, mm -hmm. hosting different low carbon tools and workshops for the public. This was a visit to Green at Shatin, a community recycling station. Mm -hmm. And the other picture is where we hosted a Venture Hong Kong Youth Workshop. Uh, so I would like to say that youth empowerment is at the core of FAIR. Uh, we're hosting a lot of uh, different internship programs, fellowships and mentorships, hoping to get more youth interested and passionate about this issue into the group and to introduce them to different opportunities. We don't want them to stay here forever, but we want them to come mm -hmm. here, acquire certain skill set to host other activities or even start their own initiative. And this is what I'm very happy to see. A lot of our members might have joined for one or two years, university students for first or second year. And now they're out there doing their own uh, eco tour pages or doing their own mm -hmm. uh, vegetarianism advocacy, like what Bafsi has been advocating for. So we hope to continue this uh, core. Um, we hope to we hope to continue this uh, youth movement and empowering them to take more ambitious action on climate change. So uh, last but not least, I'd like to quote, I would like to close with this quote, which I really like by Larry Brilliant, an inaugural executive director of Google Org. It says, change starts with ordinary people doing extraordinary things. The path to extraordinary is open to anybody at any time. Imagine me, I was sitting right there, uh, going, attending different summits, sustainability conferences, never knowing that one day I could be sitting here to give you all a speech. So if you ask me what do I hope for in the next 50 years, I'd say I would hope to see more change makers. Mm -hmm. Everyone from you here thinking you're an ordinary person, but you can also take the chance, take the leap to start something small and eventually grow it with your passion, with your drive, and with your concern for the climate and for our future. Be the agent of change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. It is always wonderful to begin our sessions with an energetic and hopeful, um, you know, young lady. Um, slightly different from Boxy and uh, Laura. I know Leslie in person, mm. so I didn't know you and Laura in person. So I read a bit about the two of you. And it's very fascinating how the two of you are advocating environmental conservation or sustainability not just as a conventional environmentalist, but really through your professional um, area of work. Mm. So maybe we can now turn mm. to Laurel, lady first, uh, yeah. to see not what Laurel can <laughs> share with us about what she's been up to in uh, advocating sustainability and what's her hope for uh, Hong Kong in 50 years time. So over to you, Laurel. Hi, thank you everyone. I don't know if you can see me. Can you see me? Well, you can hear me. That's good enough. Um, thank you so much for having me here. To, yeah. 
following up Natalie is a tough act. Uh, it's a tough act to follow, but um, it was great to hear about Natalie's work. We're actually technically classmates at Oxford. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, I mean, for me personally, I, I'm a journalist and um, I hope that the power of storytelling, the power mm. of um, things like, you know, anything from photography to documentaries to writing, um, I'm hoping that through these mediums, I can, or we can all sort of tell stories that affect people emotionally, that reach into their hearts and minds and, and you know, one step at a time, open their eyes to what's happening in the world. And most importantly, also open up their eyes to what they're capable of and um, the power that they have to enact change because change is the accumulation of millions of little decisions that we all make on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I am also a huge fan of mana because it makes vegan and vegetarian eating so easy. Um, and and that's one decision we can make in our diet. Um, so for me as a journalist, I hope to tell stories um, about climate change, about uh, biodiversity loss, trying to bring these very far away and maybe even abstract issues feel more relevant, more personal, um, more urgent, and hope to reach people that way. Um, Years ago, I also started uh, a little project called the Hong Kong Sports Initiative. Uh, it basically tries to accomplish what Natalie did with Vare, and I'm so happy to hear about her project because she did that way better than I ever could. Um, I realized my role really is better served telling stories, um, but the, the idea behind the project was to raise awareness about biodiversity in Hong Kong, especially endemic biodiversity, because similar to Natalie, I realized that Hong Kong has so much to offer. And um, not only that, but people in Hong Kong are also so disconnected from nature, so dis disconnected from everything around them. And I thought that the first step to getting people more, um, more willing to protect nature is to make them appreciate nature, which we can do by getting them out in nature. And what better city to do that than Hong Kong, where it's so accessible. And tragically, so many people aren't aware of that, though I think things are certainly changing. Um, so if I, just to, cap, to summarize things, um, yeah, I just hope to use the power of storytelling to mm -hmm. make people believe in the power within themselves to, to change mm -hmm. the world. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. Um, the ability to start to tell um, convincing story is actually very, very important. Um, and food is an other necessity. And I think Bobsy very successfully kind of inducing the core value of sustainability um, into our everyday life. You know, what we eat, uh, you know, what you eat, what you've done in your restaurant is not just um, um, telling us that, that these foods are uh, good for the environment, they're actually good for your health and they're tasty. So tell us more about your journey and also let us know your, your visions in 50 years time. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be sitting here and having this chance to talk to so many people. And I'm very impressed with Natalie and what she's done and doing it's, it's, it's good good to see your generation so passionate mm. and laurel of course i've known over the years um i admire her work um it's only in the last nine years i've been mana mm. if i was sitting here 10 years ago you might have considered me as bobsy from life mm. before that bobsy from bookworm cafe or or whatever it is i've been doing over the years but one thing has never changed in the last 30 years is the creative and cultural effort to raise awareness about the fact that we only have one planet, our home, Mother Earth. So my background is fashion. So I started doing eco fashion 30 years ago and that's how I came to Hong Kong. So through Gaia, which is my original company, everything we did as a fashion company was to raise 
environmental awareness. And we did that through graphics, through design, through a packaging. And then in 97, 98, when I first opened the Bookworm Cafe on Lama Island, um, we did the same thing through food. So no matter what the medium is, um, we need to raise awareness. And we need to do it in a creative way, but in an attractive way. So it attracts the young people. So when I was doing fashion, you know, we had a big following amongst younger people because the designs were pretty. So you bought a t-shirt and then as you put on the t-shirt or wore it or your friends saw it, they said, oh, what's that? That's the earth. And what's the message there? And so t-shirts um, and sweatshirts were like walking billboards. So that's how the journey of raising environmental awareness really took off. And then through food, I realized that the power of food is much more powerful. And we all love to eat um, three times a day, four times a day, five times a day, 365 days a year. Everybody loves food. And food is a powerful way, a powerful medium of inspiring change. So in 97, 98, through the Bookworm Cafe and now through Mana, we raise awareness about the impact our diet is having on our planet and ourselves. So scientists now are talking about an alarming figure of over 50% of all the global climate crises, whether it's deforestation or water pollution or air pollution, et cetera, is coming from our diet. So diet change, not climate change, has become the clarion call of mana. We have to change our diets and not change the climate. So food is, is a powerful and integral part of raising environmental awareness. We, we can no longer separate them. And for decades, I've been going to talks and events and always to do with raising environmental awareness. And seldom there would be any vegetarian food on offer in these events, yet these events were for environmental protection. And, and I used to get so frustrated. I'd say, we're here to protect the environment and educate people on the environment. Yet all I see is, is meat and pork and beef and chicken and cheese and what's going on. So I always referred to um, a plant-based diet as the pink elephant in the room. It's sitting there and everyone can see it, but no one wants to talk about it. Luckily, in the last um, decade, and especially in the last three, four years, things have changed, and now we are connecting diet to climate. So I can't overemphasize that if we want to be environmentalists, if we want to be conscious, active change makers, if we want to be proactively involved in raising awareness, if we care for our children, if we care for Mother Earth, if we care for nature, if we care for this beautiful life we have, we have to change our diets. We have to move towards a plant-based diet. And I'm not expecting everybody on Monday morning to become you know, vegetarian or vegan, but I do hope anybody listening can immediately reduce their consumption of meat, fish, and dairy. It's imperative. We cannot save the planet. We cannot grow and evolve as a humanity if we continue to eat animals. Eating animals is extremely destructive to the environment and to our own health. So we have to stop eating animals, to put it bluntly. And I really expect everybody in this room and everybody watching to reduce their consumption of meat, fish, and dairy and make the connection between what we eat, who we become, how we behave, how we think, and more importantly, what impact our diet is having on our natural resources and our planet in its entirety. So having been involved with fashion, I still am. Having been involved with music, I still am. Having been involved in publishing, we published Positive News Hong Kong for, for over seven years. Having been involved in tree planting and environmental campaigning and education and public speaking and talks, I still believe <laughs> the power of food is the most powerful tool in my hands in my heart, in my mind, in my soul, in my spirit, in what I do in this life. 
So diet change, not climate change, remains a very powerful clarion call. And Natalie's generation and Gen Z, the younger generation, are really waking up to it. So our customers in Mana are getting younger and younger. And, and this is how we change, you know. Um, change happens gradually. And when there comes a certain tipping point, if you like, mm -hmm. a certain amount of people who believe in the same thing, it spreads through, through culture, like through like osmosis. Mm -hmm. You know, once upon a time, we all believed the earth was flat. Everybody believed the earth was flat. And suddenly, when a certain percentage of people believed the earth was round, suddenly, lo and behold, all of humanity believed the earth was round. And it's the same thing today with the environmental crisis. Once enough of us believe that Mother Earth is in danger, in jeopardy, once we reach a tipping point, maybe it's 20%, nobody's quite sure, then the rest of humanity will follow suit and will say, of course the earth is round. Who said the earth was flat? And the same thing is happening now. We say, of course we have to protect the earth. We, of course we have to protect Mother Nature. Who is saying we, we shouldn't, you know? And this collective consciousness, if you like, is what spreads the change. And Natalie, you touched on some very important points, but what links all of these points together, whether it's the youth or the elder people or politicians or economists or environmentalists, what links us all together is our consciousness, mm -hmm. is, our, is our minds. So once we ch change our minds or shift consciousness, we naturally become environmentalists. We naturally care. It, it's, it's innate, it's within the human condition. So once we become aware, that's it. Once you become aware of fire, you're not going to stick your hands in fire anymore. Once you become aware that our earth is dying, being killed, I should say, you stop behaving in a foolish and uneducated and stupid way. You change naturally because humans in essence are good. We are born good. We only become educated to become fools later on. And this change we can see is happening now globally. And I'm hugely optimistic. Uh, in fact, that's the reason I wake up every morning. <laughs> there's no other reason to wake up that there's hundreds of millions of us in the world today, hundreds of millions of us who have already shifted consciousness, who've changed their minds, who are out there making a difference through their vocation, through their passion, through their jobs, through their families. Hundreds of millions of us who've already changed. And therein lies the hope that as more and more of us change, eventually there will come a tipping point where all of humanity will embrace a plant-based diet, our economies will become sustainable, our educational systems will become holistic, our medicine will become holistic, uh, uh, the way we build cities, the way we design cities will become sustainable naturally, naturally. There, there doesn't have to be any physical force or any wars. You know, COVID-19 is doing that for us today. So I call COVID-19 the great awakener. It is really waking us up before it's too late. We have a chance. And COVID-19 is coming along and saying, wakey, wakey, pay attention to what really matters. The soil, the water, the fresh air, our natural resources, our health. What is more important than that? So you asked me about 50 years time? Yes. Wow. <laughs> well, in 50 years time, in 50 years time, humanity, humanity would, would have already shifted consciousness. consciousness. Mm. It would have already changed its worldview. Mm. So today, the dominant worldview is based on a materialism assumption. We assume that we live in a physical universe where everything is physical. And our sciences have been advocating that now for five, 600 years. That is an assumption. So as we shift, we realize that we live in a consciousness worldview. And therefore, everything is made out of consciousness. Everything. So we will build our economies, our educational systems, all our institutions will follow suit naturally because that's what happens when paradigms shift. When a paradigm shift, it's a total shift of everything. All the institutions, law, education, business, health, they all shift following the worldview. 
So our worldview is shifting away now from a materialism worldview into a consciousness worldview. So in 50 years time, in 30 years time, <laughs> we would truly believe that we are not separate from nature. We've been educated for a long, long time that humans and nature are separate. So in, in 30 years time or 40 years time, we would be educating humanity that we are one and the same with nature yeah. mm -hmm. because that is the root cause the root cause of this environmental crisis and the health crisis and the social crisis is coming from this assumption that we are separate from nature that we are one and the same and in 30 years 40 years 50 years time this will be the norm so we'd we'll be saying of course the earth is round mm -hmm. who said the earth was flat <laughs> Thank you so much. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, especially personally, I come from um, an indigenous family uh, in Hong Kong. Mm. So, and I also um, had my education in New Zealand, where they also have a lot of respect over the indigenous tribe um, over there. So, what Bobsy mentioned somehow, it's uh, a lot of this very strong message about human beings are not separate from the Mother Earth is in fact still a very strong focus among a lot of these uh, um, indigenous uh, populations around the world. So I do hope that everyone um, attending the conference can feel the positive energy <laughs> started to build up in this room. I, I think it's actually quite amazing. <laughs> but, you know, as an academic, coming back now, how are we doing right now? Okay, we do have a very positive and hopeful that we can envision. But how are we doing now? So, Leslie, so you mentioned that you uh, won the competition with some of your peers. So, would you say that you know many of the youngsters in your generation, um, they are getting quite a lot of this awareness, and they are starting to do something about it. You know, taking some real actions. Would you say we are doing actually much better? at the moment comparing to like 10 years ago? Mm. I, I would definitely think we are doing much better because mm. our youths are more educated on these, the importance of climate issue. And we have climate change incorporated in a lot of our syllabuses, mm. not only in Hong Kong, but also in Italy, climate change education has become compulsory. And Hong Kong still has some way to go, even though we have touched, we touch a bit upon it in our liberal studies curriculum. Mm. Well. Uh, I think in recent years, especially in the past five to 10 years, since the IPCC has been publishing the assessment reports and the latest like 2018 report on special of 1.5 degrees of warming, it has raised a lot of awareness and including in climate activism or mm -hmm. in some kind of bottom up uh, education initiatives. I'm seeing more Instagram platforms mm -hmm. or even media channels uh, speaking about it. And this is why uh, my friends and I founded the Hong Kong Youth for Climate Action in June 2019, in June 2020, where we hoped to form an official platform to aggregate all these voices because we're seeing a lot of fragmentation mm -hmm. in the current work. Some groups are like saying, speaking maybe solely on vegetarianism mm. and some groups raising awareness on ocean waste or plastic waste. Of course, all of them are equally important and just as impactful but what if we have a platform to connect all of them and to form a greater coalition where we can become a voice a collective voice to pitch to the government mm. or maybe just become a larger force uh, aggregating these small like individual voices we really present these uh, youth uh, perspective and voices into the government meeting rooms not just letting them float around in the instagram realm or in the facebook realm mm. and so i think uh, we are definitely doing a lot more, but there's still a value action mm. gap which we need to bridge and also some sort of platform to connect all these mm. smaller voices and to make a scattered picture into a collective voice for good. That's very good. I actually, following up on what you just mentioned, um, I've got a question from the audience. Each of you can comment on or respond to this question. So this question basically ask now that we seem to be on a good path towards sustainability but with the pandemic there will you know an affordably uh, economic crash mm. um, and also there will be a downturn of a lot of these um, well-being 
um, the property issue, etc., will become more visible um, sooner or later. So the question is, does a certain decline in all the satisfaction of deficiency need, loss of a job, diminished feelings of safety, reduced economic security, affect people's concern about the natural environment? So maybe we can go over to uh, Noro first and sure. see if you have an opinion on this and then come back to Bobsy and Leslie. Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's a great question. Um, you know, what does the pandemic mean for the future of the planet, especially when it comes to climate change? Um, I definitely could see why we might be concerned that, you know, with a sudden heightened concern for our immediate needs might lead to lesser concern for the environment. But I actually don't think that's the case. I think we've mm. all seen the impact of lesser economic activity and how it's actually been good for nature. You know, in Hong Kong, obviously, I would not make such a causal link. But in Hong Kong, we had such a glorious summer weather-wise, you know, we, we had such clear air and everyone really enjoyed that. And I think we all realized that might have something to do with the fact that economic activity has declined so much. Um, I think people realize that there's a lot of things that we probably don't actually really need. You know, now I'm tuning into this conference via Zoom, I think one, two years ago, that probably would have been a no-go, would have been deemed too weird or too inconvenient, mm. uh, but now we're all on Zoom all the time. So I think the pandemic has forced us all to, has removed us all from the, the this rat race, um, this, mm. this status quo that we've all been following, maybe without putting that much thought into it. And it's forced us to really be more intentional, maybe mm. in, in what we need, uh, in what is really necessary, what, you know, is life really all these material things? Is it really traveling all the time? So that's that's my perspective. Um, but of course, the next step is 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 trying to turn this consciousness shift, like Bobsy said, into actual policy change, into actual behavior mm -hmm. change. Um, and I think that will be the the great challenge of of twenty twenty one. Bobsy, Natalie, you want to go first? Yeah. <laughs> um, the econ economy is sick, um, our culture is sick, our whole worldview is sick. We've seen ourselves as separate from nature and that is the root cause of the problem. So to respond to the viewer who is asking this question, it's necessary medicine. COVID-19 is a necessary medicine for the patient to recover. Because when you're sick, what do you do? You go home, you rest, you fast, you heal yourself, or you go to the doctor, the hospital, you get medicine. So COVID-19, sadly, is a necessary medicine for your humanity to really wake up and pay attention to what really matters. So yes, there is going to be a loss of jobs. I mean, I'm in the restaurant world and we're suffering. But this is inevitable, it has to happen. Because whenever there's a paradigm shift, the old ways of doing things start to collapse and crumble from within, mm. right? Once upon a time, the slave industry on this planet was very, very big. We all needed slaves to operate our businesses and our lands. And, but we had to abolish slavery. We had to end slavery. But that was very painful yeah. for a lot of people who depended on slaves, for industries that depended on slaves whether it was shipbuilding or growing food or plantations, whatever. Mm -hmm. So whenever there's a collapse of an old paradigm, whenever there's a collapse of an old system, there has to be a period of turbulence mm -hmm. and trouble and fear. And we are exactly going through this now. Mm -hmm. So I, I say it once again, COVID-19 is the great awakener. Mm -hmm. It's tragic, yes, and I feel sorry for anyone who is losing family members or loved ones. It's never fun for the people left behind. But this is necessary medicine for us to change our systems towards sustainable systems. Sustainable systems, sustainable economies that support growth. It, it has to happen, I'm afraid. Before we turn to Leslie, just a follow-up question, Leslie. So, um, 
did you actually observe um, any of your peers, you know, who are also in the catering industry, are also having this um, awakening uh, moment, same as you do? So how, how, how do you see, you know, what's your sectors been doing and, and you know now that they are almost like life and death they are fighting for survival mm. so how how did you see their reaction so far for a lot of them they're still stuck in the old way and it, it's it's an economic crisis and they're suffering and they're struggling and they're trying their best to to manage and survive really but where we see the interesting change is in the younger yeah, generation who are starting plant-based restaurants mm -hmm. and delis and groceries and stores and shops. And that segment of the economy is doing okay. Mm. There is a growth there in, in natural foods and natural mm -hmm. medicines and, 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 and plant-based foods. There is a growth growing in that section. Mm -hmm. So the biggest change we see is people changing their business models, moving away from the old way of doing business. So towards more of a sustainable way of doing business that incorporates the health of the community and the planet as well as the health of your business. But it, in, the, in the short term, in the immediate term, it's, it's very painful for all of us in, in the restaurant world. Um, we're, we're, we're all struggling and we have huge salary burdens and huge cost of food and the rent's not cheap. And, mm. Um, but we, we do have to change our way of doing business. A modus operandus, how we operate our business has to shift towards something more sustainable. We can't keep on pumping out plastic packaging and styrofoam packaging and, and pumping out animals like there's no tomorrow, like we, like we have two or three planets. We only have one planet. So we, we as business leaders, as entrepreneurs, we have to change the way we do business so that we become part of the solution and not part of the problem. But my heart um, goes out to okay. everyone on, on every economy in, in the world who, it, it's a hard time, you know, but, but it's necessary. From, from this tragedy, there will come opportunity. There will come creativity, tremendous creativity. I actually just want to, I don't know if you guys can hear me, is so, a, is, no, is, never mind. <laughs> you know, uh, a curse or is it a real opportunity for uh, climate change um, resilience? Mm. Well, I pretty much agree with what Laurel and Babsi have said. Um, COVID-19 can indeed be seen as mm -hmm. an awakener. Of course, we, it, it is dangerous to say that uh, COVID-19 solves climate change or mm -hmm. makes it better because it's also perpetuating a lot of the other climate injustices like under COVID, maybe mm -hmm. people suffering furthermore from the climate impact. So these issues are pretty entangled and we need to be aware of that. But of course, there are a lot of opportunities that we can reap from it and how reframing it as an opportunity for green recovery. Mm -hmm. So now we are all disrupted and how do we build back better? in a more sustainable way. And as Bobsy said, changing our business models uh, to incorporate more social elements. And in the green finance industry, we're seeing more investors being mm -hmm. aware of uh, the risk in investing in fossil fuel and more voices uh, leading towards divestment. And government also waking up to adopt new models. For example, the city of Amsterdam has adopted the donor economics model, which I just mentioned, to as a part to rebuild their city after COVID-19. So these are some sort of beacons of lights that we are seeing, uh, which illuminates our future to a better path. And what is decided now pretty much determines uh, what our future looks like in 50 years. Because mm -hmm. All the infrastructures are being built at this moment, which will be locked in. And yeah, so I think it's important for us to grab this opportunity to uh, encourage our policymakers, decision makers, and to gather the force mm -hmm. of civil society in leading the transformation for a sustainable and climate resilient future. Mm, thank you. Sorry, could I? We I also have another question. From I just wanted me? to. Laura wait, is oh, talking, hi. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just wanted to give the example of where I am right now. I'm actually in Venice, Italy, for mm -hmm. a story. And talking to people here, um, so of course, Venice is. is like the number one tourist destination in the world and the economy here has come to rely on tourism 
at the expense of the city, at the expense of the local residents. And now, of course, with COVID, there's absolutely no res no tourists at all. This is my mm -hmm. first time here. I understand I'm really lucky to see it without any tourists, but apparently normally it's just tourists or shoulder to shoulder packed in the city. And now with COVID-19, the economy has been really hit. I've met people who've lost their jobs because of COVID, but they're still advocating for sustainable tourism because they're seeing their city die you know they keep on talking about how Venice has become a Disneyland with so many people mm. coming in for just a few hours coming off huge cruise ships trampling on the city um, while local you know all the local stores that represent the culture and the heart of Venice are being replaced with generic chain restaurants with big brand names and everyone's coming here leaving a massive carbon footprint, leaving a massive literal footprint um, to see this place that they're actually killing by the act of what they're doing. And mm -hmm. I think here in Venice, and of course, there's also a flooding problem, not to mention, which will only be worsened by climate change. So Venice is, is a good example of this microcosm where it has come to rely on everything that COVID-19 has stopped. And it's made everyone it's given, I think, the city an opportunity to ask itself, what do we really want? Do we really want people to come for a few hours and not really understand the city, not really see the city while ruining the city? Or do we want another model where we invite people mm -hmm. to come to really appreciate our culture, have a more meaningful exchange, leave a lesser footprint while gaining more in the process? So this year has been... Um, a really eye-opening experience for me because there's also not many places where these examples are so stark from unsustainable economic models to to mm -hmm. climate change. I so honestly you treat it like a princess over there. <laughs> <laughs> there's no one around. I think you know Italians. They don't really care. They're like, oh, you're here. You're lucky to see the city like this. <laughs> <laughs> I personally actually quite and um, I like the term new normal. Because what sort of uh, always um, come to me is, you know, sustainability or environmental conservation to many people are just something good to have. You know, I can still live my ordinary, regular life. And when I have the mood, then I can do a little bit of this sustainability act. Mm. But this term new normal, um, although that usually refer to wearing masks and so on, <laughs> but I do see, you know, if we can embed some of these uh, sustainability sustainability lifestyle into this new normal. It does become some new normal. Um, I think that that would be very interesting. Um, another question we have from, from the audience. So coming back to Asia, I guess Asia is recovering but better comparing mm. to the Western cities. And, but at the same time, our awakening um, in terms of uh, sustainability, uh, it's a bit lag behind comparing to, again, some of the Western cities. So the question is, you know, how are we going to really influence the mass public on what they can do towards uh, sustainable development? What would be the one thing that you would like to propose um, of the uh, public audience? So, Bob, do you want to go first? Become aware of the necessity for change. Mm. Because once we become aware of the necessity for change, mm. we are empowered. Mm. And once we're empowered, there's no stopping us. Mm. We become cultural creatives that go out there and change the world. But we have to understand the necessity for change in the first place. Why are we in this predicament? Mm. Why have we almost killed our planet? Mm. Why? So perhaps COVID-19 now is a chance to reimagine, mm. reevaluate, rethink, reconsider, relove mm. our life and our planet. So this is a wonderful opportunity with COVID-19, the great awakening now waking us up to the potential mm. of how we can have paradise here on earth. Mm. There's no need for us to be living, chopping down the forest, depleting the ocean, poisoning the earth mm. to develop. This is an old way of doing things. We can have all of that and still develop and grow our economies and our, and our ways of living and our wellness and our happiness, which what 
matters the most at the end of the day. Will you still be using food as your magic in doing this? Would it be smooth? Food, sustainable diet. Of course, that's integral. That is the biggest impact we can have as a human being alive today. The single biggest impact. Forget about turning off your tap and taking flights. And these are all important, but these are minuscule compared to a change in diet. If over 50% of this calamity is coming from humanity's diet, then let's address this big monster, this big pig elephant in the room. Let's change our diets and not change our planets. You know? So luckily, so what's your plan for Asia? To become more sustainable, more rapidly? Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the most important thing is to appreciate the new normal, mm -hmm. uh, to accept this kind of new, we cannot go back to the normal way of living and why not embrace a better version of it by being more green and more sustainable. But one, one thing I want to rebut, Bobsy, is taking a flight is also very important in changing our climate because these mm -hmm. kind of carbon footprints not counted in government figures because it's cross-border. Mm -hmm. So a lot of time we miss these linkages, seeing the, the, the ability to see the broader picture because of issues related to double counting. Uh, Hong Kong is heavily relying on import. Mm -hmm. We are importing a lot of agricultural goods, importing a lot of products that we're purchasing. And all these footprints are not accounted for uh, these consumption-based emissions, not presented in government figures, and we tend to forget about them. When we talk about the net zero target by 2050 for Hong Kong or even for China, maybe we're just referring to what we are producing here locally, mm. but not what we're importing from other parts mm. of the world or from third world countries. And these impacts just indiscriminately placed on them in an unfair and an unequal way. So I think COVID-19 is also a way, like we're all trapped here in Hong Kong now, unable to fly away. And it's also a time for us to appreciate local, to appreciate things around us, start buying, uh, start purchasing uh, local organic mm. farm products and buying less imported goods and staying local uh, by joining eco tours and appreciating the urban pockets of nature around mm. you. So one advice for everyone is just to appreciate being where you are and appreciate yourself, appreciate around you and to start thinking about how we tackle consumption-based emission by adopting a more minimalistic lifestyle. And mm. of course, by adopting a vegan diet, by adopting, you know, uh, lesser meat and lesser goods, just be simple. Yeah. That's very good. Laura, what's your suggestions for Asia? Mm. Um, well, well, I think in Asia or in general, I think there is this narrative. I think, you know, by this time, I would say, a lot of people, if not most people, are aware of climate change, are aware they'll be disastrous if we don't do mm. anything about it. And I think that might lead to this feeling of helplessness a lot of time, or you know, that it's something that they can't address on their own. So for for me, you know, as a storyteller, my goal is to really change that narrative um, mm. and to to remind people that they are the power really is in their hands, like has been emphasized so many times throughout this panel um, that we all can do something, that the only thing, the only way we will do something is is if each of us do a little bit. Um, and I would also, I think, urge, you know, the community of people who are involved in climate change to be more intentional about how they are reaching people. Natalie and I were actually in the same class last term um, about climate change and communication. And you know, I personally learned a lot about how there's this whole field of, um, of research regarding how people actually respond to the way climate change is presented in the media. So I think mm -hmm. for us as, um, you know, change makers and as leaders in this community, I think we have to start being much more intentional and aware of who we are reaching, how we're reaching them, um, and what we are urging them to do. Because I think at this point, there's a lot of noise, a lot of voices speaking up about this, but people might be a bit lost about how exactly they can help. So, and 
and maybe we're also maybe reaching the wrong people. Like, um, I think, again, from a storyteller perspective, a lot of international media is very Western centric. Centric. It comes from the West. So I also yep. urge people in Asia to tell their own stories, to speak up and, and find solutions that are relevant to their own communities um, and, to, and to speak to each other because I think also that shift away from that, that Western centric perspective is also really important. Thank you very much. I think um, this is almost time. Mm -hmm. um, thank you again, uh, all the three speakers for the wonderful sharing. And I do really hope that we can keep this positive energy and you know make the sustainable lifestyle the new normal so thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, thank you very much thank you <laughs> <laughs>